Stand by. And Dan Winston's group is really fantastic, and and uh, they've done a lot of legendary monsters, if you would. And in this case, they had, uh, I think, a really tough bar to cross, which was people were very familiar with the things that they were building. So they had to really access that familiarity, but then take it to the next step. What was kind of neat about Doom in particular is because we had all this like broad terry to walk through, we could go through like every single exciting thing we ever thought was cool in a horror film and you know put people through those experiences, whether it's getting like stalked by a dude with a chainsaw or something more psychological. It's like we 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 had the freedom to kind of hit every one of those points. It'd been a while since I'd done a, a good monster film, so this was was exciting. So I went online, started looking at the images from the game, and I liked the feel of the creatures, they're very meaty, kind of organic looking. I thought that would translate well. And I think the idea was, was for us to keep the essence of these characters. We weren't told to lock to their designs, per se. As a team, what we wanted to bring to it was what we do in film, as far as bringing texture and detail that you can't do in a video game. Well, the first time I saw the creatures was back in Stan Winston's studio when I was back there and they showed them to me on the computer. And I thought, this is absolutely incredible. So when I saw it, I was like, that would be fantastic. If, if we can make that, like 80% of that, they were like, no, we'll make 100% of it. <laughs> When designing these creatures, after uh, we come up with our 2D concept art, then we have to start the sculpture process. We had to do body casts and have them into sort of a neutral position. Those are replicated in like a fiberglass that disassembles to aid in the molding process later. It's tons of fittings to make things work and make sure it's all right. So uh, Brian Steele and I both were cast months and months ago. And we had several fittings. Um, the first thing that you do start with is a head and shoulder life cast, and then a, a body cast from head to toe, where they wrap you in plaster bandages and, and get a, an impression of your entire body. And then you actually start sculpting on top of their body what the creature's gonna look like. And you stay as faithful as you can to the 2D design, but certain things happen in 3D when you start walking around something, looking at it from from all angles, and, and it sort of modifies and morphs uh, based on reality. Once that's signed off, then we went into molds, and then from molds, you have to start fabricating all of the, um, the suits and the parts, and then in this case, all the internal muscle structures and putting all the mechanics into them so that the, it's moving. This happens to be a suit, so it's something that I slip into now, zip up the back, plunk the head on, put the, the hands on, I'm ready to go. What we were trying to uh, explore and achieve was internal muscles being able to move with the performer. A lot of times it's just a big bulky suit around somebody, so you might not see the scapula move or it's restricting for the actor. And by making these things independent or using elastics to move like a tendon or muscle structure inside, we got a lot of freedom in motion, which I think transfers. They're me now, a demonic imp. So uh, so what's happened to, to their body? Well, uh, an imp, uh, these creatures are, their bone structure has shifted and changed. Uh, heads have expanded some. The, the coolest one is the, the I, that I love was the, the sewer imp that you see down there that's uh, actually was Dr. Willits, but you don't know that right away. Um, He's, you know, got 11 eyes on his head. Action! The Baron character, which is similar to the Hell Knight in the game. He's a big, thick, hulking creature. Sort of looked like old, decayed meat was sort of the idea. So it's kind of grayish and then filleted areas on his skin. With these imps, because they're based more on Doug's structure, which is very lean and sinewy, with differences in completely different heads was to also separate them out by color. Oh, there's something behind me, isn't there? Ah! What's great is these monsters are not CGI monsters. These are real monsters with real gravity. Um, and you could always tell in movies when you see the CGI monsters because there's no gravity and they're kind of like hopping everywhere, but these monsters are the real deal.
when they walk, you feel the weight of their walk and you see the weight of their body and their, and their muscle structure. And you see that in these monsters. Our workload on Doom sort of broke into two uh, categories. The Carmack, when he's starting to transform and what happens to rock in the movie, those are, those are pure prosthetic jobs. The Baron or the Imps, it was a combination of a bodysuit which was form-fitting to the actor which changed his body shape, which is in a way a giant prosthetic on him, but it also blended off into uh, animatronic heads. I have an earpiece in, 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 my, in my one ear and I'm connected to John Rosengrant. He's usually standing by the monitors and then he can tell me in my earpiece, you know, move a little bit to the left, move a little bit to the right, um, uh, you know, reach, you're, you're covering your face when you do this, so don't do that and bring it lower, whatever. So I get a lot of direction in my ear from that. Now being able to talk back is hard because I'm, I'm not mic'd to talk back, but I yell and, and go like this a lot, like, yeah, heard you, yeah. Now, this is scary. Thank you. I always get asked the questions, you know, is the, are they phasing out the animatronics? Is that going away? Because everything is going CG. And what we try to think about is what's the best answer for the shot? You know, if it's better for it to be CG in the shot, we're all for that. And if it can be done live, I think the benefits of doing it live with the animatronics is it gives eye lines and it gives reactions and things for the actor to perform with. I think it helps to have something there lit and real for everyone to focus on and react off of. One of the first things I, I said to everyone is that we've got to get great performers in these suits, not just anybody that's big that can fit in or really skinny, but someone that can also act. I think it's so important that there's a real physicality, which, you know, you, you can have something that looks as good as you like, but if someone hasn't got the physicality to pull it off, then um, it'll never succeed. Brian was the Baron character, and he is a huge, thick, uh, really ripped, sin sinewy, but huge, muscular character. Doug ended up playing the, uh, the three different imps, three or four that we ended up doing for this. In this film, uh, there really was no one that could actually double me because these suits are made for a 6'4", 140-pound actor guy named Doug Jones, and no one's really going to be able to fit into those, so I have to do whatever, whatever I have to do, including taking lots of bullet hits and flying backwards and, uh, you know, getting hit with the butt of a gun from Carl Urban. Yeah, so there's, uh, I had to do a lot of that in, in the sewer, especially in the water. It had its appendix removed. When I'm sitting down to kind of build something, it's like, I, f I think it's really important to draw from real life. And I think, um, but like, particularly with the, the Doom creatures, you'll see a lot of things, a lot of kind of semi-obvious, inobvious, really blatantly obvious uh, um, adaptations of, like, the human body. And you'll see, like, you know, weird little pelvic bone shapes kind of, like, you know, cresting through people's heads. Uh, um, I know everybody finds sex scary, so that's all over the place. To make these things sort of disgusting and repel, or just to repel, oh, don't even look at that, uh, which I think that needed in this, because it's scary. A lot of what we drew upon uh, was forensic uh, pathology books. Kind of twisted, you know, you're looking at dead people in various states of decomposition and whatnot. I got to actually go and attend some dissection classes at the Prague Medical School, which is like going back into a Victorian teaching hospital or something. And I'm lucky that I'm not squeamish. I, I can sort of, you know, switch off the uh, squeamish side and sort of employ the scientific side in a way. This is brain matter from Portman. There's a couple scenes where she's performing autopsies, and it's funny because she is the one who can stomach what's going on, and the guys are definitely having a hard time. The Creature Workshop team is so deft and precise with what they do. These boys walking around with pots of things called ultra pus and ultra slime, and you know, working out how, how we can get a really bilious looking black blood for these creatures, because they don't want the, the creature blood to be the same as human blood. So they found a way of putting little pellets and really making the blood coagulate and be thick and gory. It's, it's brilliant. Withdraw! Withdraw behind the nano wall! Doom was a lot of fun on a lot of levels, but it, it was very liberating in that, you know what? This is going to be an R-rated movie. 
we're gonna see some gore and we're gonna make it nasty. <laughs> Breakfast of champions. One of the big failures of, a, of monster design is a lot of people um, make, make superheroes with teeth. You know, they're, they're generally kind of like big muscular guys that, you know, you kind of think that whoever's making this kind of wishes they were them versus wanting to run from them. And I think, uh, I mean, I get caught up in that too. But I think horror films and games fail when they try to uh, be very specific about what's, what, you know, things that are in this nebulous territory is like, that's what's scary. I mean, confusion is scary. <laughs> A lot of that stuff is fresh and creepy, but there's still this like hint of humor about it. At the end of the day, if you can sit back and, and you've scared somebody or they've, they've turned their eyes from the screen and said, oh my God, that's gross, that's, there's also a lot of fun on that level. We took pictures of The Rock in, uh, you know, with a bit of expression to his face, which, which helps you when you realize the design, you can kind of see the character in the film rather than just a, a static look. And we did many different versions, ranging from very subtle to wild. It helps to show the range of, well, it could be this crazy, because then it, it answers everyone's questions. Then you can kind of go through and, you know, hone out, well, it's cool, but it's too much, or that's too subtle, we're not gonna see that. Richie Alonzo, along with Jeff Dawn, put the makeup on the rock once everyone had decided on what level the appliances should be. Put the prosthetics on today it was a two hour makeup job. This is the second layer of my prosthetics. And the third level, which we'll put in on Saturday, is about a three and a half hour makeup job. And I'll be all out B M F O P. The baddest motherfucker on the planet. Six o'clock in the morning, our last day shooting in beautiful Prague. We have three stages of makeup. During this five minute fight, we'll see him go through these three stages. Um, one of the stages is just his knuckles bursting out. Another stage is appliances on his cheeks here, here, and on his jawline. We put some fake teeth in his mouth and make him not look so white, so beautiful, so Hollywood movie starish. And uh, so that's the, that's the second stage. Here, you want to put it in? No. <laughs> sure. Germs, germs, they're germs. Have germs. Then the third stage is what we're doing right now, and that will include a forehead piece. We'll be covering up his eyebrows, putting new eyebrows on, putting cheek pieces on, both here and here, a jaw piece, and these full-fledged monster lenses. This is basically the same stuff that was used on Wizard of Oz. It's that old, the technology. It has a very rubbery feel, so everybody knows. Feels like dried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> it tastes like chicken, too. There's better materials nowadays, such as silicone and gelatin. The problem is that they don't breathe, and with heat, with action, they don't hold up. They will literally melt. A gelatin piece will melt off your face. The way we end up blending all of this together is, ideally, you have each piece slightly overlapping each other. That way you only have one line to deal with to cover up to camouflage instead of two lines if they barely meet each other. And we use a material, a couple of materials. One of them is called Bondo. It is a thick, gooey material that looks like Bondo. And it's actually a thickened um, adhesive. And we're able to blend out little rough edges and add some texture so that you no longer are able to see that line. Then we end up painting it with a prosthetic paint. It's actually an acrylic paint use many different colors for that, and continue to add texture, shine, dull it down in places if it's too shiny, and uh, do everything we can to make it look like skin, make the eye believe that it's skin on camera. Our first layer of paint was applied with sponges and brushes. We added a kind of a thick layer to take away the, the foam color coming through. Now. We're going in there with an airbrush, just feathering it out, blending into his actual skin color, taking the, the fake looking foam and trying to blend it into real looking skin. This is the first step of it. This is the same material, this acrylic paint that I use to cover his tattoo, whether it be just one tattoo or the tattoos that cover a quarter of his body, his upper body. And uh, usually about three different coats of this, three different colors of it gives it a realistic three-dimensional skin tone. What Richie's doing now is he is airbrushing with some inks 
the veins that he had sculpted, because Richie sculpted all of these pieces for rock. He is uh, intensifying the three-dimensional veins on his forehead with this airbrush ink. What I'm doing now is applying the eyebrows. These are real hair eyebrows that have been hand-stitched. Each hair has been hand-stitched onto this very fine lace material to match up with Rock's real eyebrows. I use this photo as reference just so that I can remember where his real eyebrows are underneath those appliances. And we're applying a little bit of spirit gum, same adhesive that's been around for decades <laughs> and used in the theater for decades to apply hair goods and appliances like these. So we'll juice you up on the set with a sweat and okay. uh, stick the contacts in on the set, put the teeth on the set, and you'll be ready to film. And then Here we are. Then it's up to you. About four hours later, <laughs> finished product. Great job. Thank you guys very much. Rock got into it. He really enjoyed looking in the mirror, seeing that transformation. He was just the ultimate professional. <laughs> was the visual effects supervisor for the whole film, but I was also the director for the first person shooter. So that sequence was a special unit. We called it the FPS unit. The first person shooter unit shot for about 14 days. Um, we had a, a, a planning period of about three months for that. Bang, 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 down. It's just a plain, exciting kind of concept. It was a way to convey the heightened reality that was happening. So we used it as a plot device, but also as a pure enjoyment for gamers and for people who haven't been exposed to it. The first person shooter is a five and a half minute continuous shot. It's made up of creatures in suits, stunt players, explosions, bombs, live action shooting, real sets, completely computer generated environments, computer generated creatures makeup creatures with computer-generated heads, arms, everything. I mean, we pulled out the stops and put everything we possibly could into this specific sequence. It was very challenging. He should react to bang. Three, two, one, and bang. Everybody, he reacts and that goes the same time. In the sequence of events, you have, in order of, of importance, the script, the storyboard where you essentially board your key moments. Then from there, you have to create the animatic. Then the rehearsal, the video rehearsal, then you cut it together, and then you have a, a dry run, then you have an effects rehearsal, and then you shoot it. to get from one end of the facility to the other, you had to cut. You had to break for the end of the day and put it together. So that means you had to do something called hookups, which means you had to go out of one room and into another. And there are various ways you can do hookups. You can do it by moving a camera and passing something and cutting, and then rolling the camera again on a subsequent day, put it right where it was before you cut, move right past it, and try to hook it up right between that move. That is the hardest thing you could possibly do, and we went for that kind of hookup. And it's true, we have hookups in this where you go through a room and of course the door opens, and when the door opens, we have a green screen or a blue screen. Cut, put the camera on the next day in that room and continue your move. Another that's easy is essentially whip panning, you call it. You come off something and you whip real fast to something on the other side and you essentially can jump cut or little cross dissolve right on the whip. Not, not hard to do. So we chose to sort of mix it up, but we have a lot of hookups where we're literally coming off a character very slowly, and now we're in another day, and you cannot see the scene. One of the differences, uh, visual differences, in creating a game and creating a film is this thing called aspect ratio. And what it basically means is the ratio of the height of the screen to the width of the screen. And in a computer screen, uh, you have an aspect ratio that is more square. It's 4-3, 4-3, 4-3, 4-3, 4-3, 4-3, 4-3, 4-3, 4-3, 4-3, 4-3, 4-3, 4-3, 4-3, 4-3, 4-
four units wide by three units high. So when you have that, you have a lot more latitude of bringing a gun into frame and seeing over the gun to the action in the distance. Then now translate that to a movie, and in particularly in this movie, it's widescreen to create that, that big vista of information. So now we've established a widescreen. In the game, you have a narrower peripheral view. So what happens is things can sneak up on you quicker in the game. Now you have widescreen. You have to be very careful. You hear something behind you, and it's harder to have something sneak up on you. We have narrow halls. So that's an issue of widescreen. The other thing is when you bring the gun up into frame, you eclipse the action because there's no room for the gun in that narrow height. So we had to make a decision that we brought the gun up when we needed it, we took it out when we didn't. We brought it up when we needed it out, we brought it off to the side, and we really played with the use of the gun. Sometimes we brought it up and looked through the eyepiece. We made a decision that in this case, we would use makeup effects to do the most difficult thing, and that is bodies and, and, and creatures, guys in suits that could hit the ground, that could tumble with other characters, that could fight and slug and interact. And in many cases, we took and put computer-generated heads on these creatures, because you could take that further. Oftentimes in, in makeup effects, it's the head that is the most difficult to do. CG does that well. Oftentimes in CG, the bodies are the most difficult. So we put the two together in a lot of cases. First Person Shooter was designed and planned out to be a five and a half minute continuous take. The intention was to do the full thing, put it in, and then if there were any issues that arose out of too big a difference of style between the game and what is necessary to make a movie, then cuts would be placed within the first person shooter to hook it in. Obviously in the, in the DVD and in the bonus materials, we have the option of putting the full first person shooter in. So the first time I encountered Doom, my, my brother and his friend uh, went to a computer show on the other side of town uh, that I wasn't allowed to go to. Uh, it came back with a small black disc. We marathon gamed from, you know, 8 p.m. until about 4 in the morning when my parents were stomping, you know, on the second story because they could still hear the shotgun blast through the subwoofer. We're in college. I live on the all-girls floor of my co-ed building. There was, of course, also an all-boys floor, which, of course, is where we all went. So the lights in the hallway had been shut off, and there's horrible noises coming out of people's rooms punctuated by, yeah! once in a while, and no! Back then, in the early 90s, my friends were telling me, oh man, when you play Doom, it's so awesome that you, you get nauseous in that first person shooter. I was like, oh, really? Punks. I'm playing it, I'm like, oh. Doom was Doom. It was bloody, it was violent, it was you mowing through demons with a shotgun and a chainsaw, for goodness sake was so revolutionary that it was terrifying. It was almost going into a haunted house, I guess, on your own. You, you shot a gun, something blew up into a cloud of pixelated blood, and it was just perfect cause and effect. And it just, I, I couldn't stop playing it. It's just that struggle of good and evil that somebody can, you know, for half an hour at a time, kind of jump in and put his forehead, you know, against the devil and just beat his ass down. There are so many people that can harken back to that time in the college dorms or at the office after hours or whatever where they were playing Doom. And we've got a lot of permeation into the general culture. It originally released, released uh, Wolfenstein 3D. Wolfenstein 3D was really the, the grandfather of all the whole genre of the first person shooter. Uh, it was fun, it was a first person game. You saw over the barrel of your gun. You went to these brightly colored, simple rooms. Nothing was lit. You'd open a door, a dog or a soldier would come at you, and you'd shoot them, and that was your experience. We wanted to do something more gritty. We tossed around a number of different ideas, even things like car racing games and, and stuff like that. But when we sat down and started thinking about it, what we wanted to do is take that type of, of that first person action, that adrenaline pumping action, and take it to a new level. Even at the title screen, I knew that this was something amazing that they had just stumbled upon. I saw Doom, it melted away, and then the demo of the first level was playing. And the, the hardcore music kicked in, and you saw the little skull with the glowing red eyes. It was just, it was an amazing experience. 
I knew where I wanted to go with the next step in graphics, which involved getting away from these block-based worlds. We wanted to be able to have worlds that were a lot more freeform so that we could have pentagonal rooms and uh, columns in the middle of areas and things that weren't just these 64 by 64 blocks that we had had for everything before. We added lighting for the first time so we could have dark areas and flickering lights and we knew we could do a lot of things here that would have more of this horror, creepy atmosphere to it, that it wasn't all brightly lit, pure action on there. We could start bringing in some sense of dread or foreboding and uh, areas that people could be scared of rather than just startled. We're trying to set up a sense of tension in the world, of hearing sounds, hearing monsters creeping around corners. What they did better than anybody else was the sense of urgency. Uh, and, and everything played into that, from the constant onslaught of enemies to that, you know, when you'd beat a round, it would give you your point total. Which, today's games don't bother with that, because they figure you don't care, but what was great was, Doom was always about the race to that final red panel. If you have to mow down 30 pink demons with a chainsaw, whatever you gotta do, get to that panel. And it was just, it was the ultimate adrenaline rush. It's the same thing over and over, but it's the right same thing. So it's just like, oh wow, I got through that room. I just wanna see what's next. I just wanna see what's next. Maybe there's a new monster, maybe there's a new weapon. It's, it's the classic thing that happens to a lot of people that are playing a game that's really good. You're playing it and then you look at the clock and you're like, it's 2 a.m.? You're like, oh, like, and then that dirty feeling sets in. Like, I really, okay. <laughs> you feel like you need to call someone and confess. Like something, like you just realize this thing completely got a hold of you. It was really the game that popularized the whole first-person shooter genre. You are that character, and there's a greater sense of threat when you're playing a game like that. And like, you know, you look at it, you lose your peripheral vision, you are really immersed inside of that game. Enemies were just flying at you. It really showed you how fast-paced and furious a first-person shooter could be. The levels were designed well. It was, you know, just interesting different areas. I mean, it really just pulled a whole bunch of like nascent concepts in the first person shooter era. It just sort of pulled them all together in one game. It's now you inside the world. And when something jumps out and startles you, you have people falling out of their chairs, you know, do dodging their heads side to side as things are coming at them on the monitor. What we call it is the head dodge. So you get this and this and this as the rockets are coming at them on the screen. And you get the character empathy that, that is literally unparalleled in any other form of game. The worst experience on the first level is walking through uh, a door, there's a winding pathway and green ooze on either side, and in the corner of the room you just hear the, the imp creature. You can look up and you can see him a little bit, but you just hear him with this awful groaning this, uh, noise, and you don't know exactly where it's coming from. You see him, and by the time you see him, there's a fireball in your face. Doom was so irreverent and underground that it was almost like you know, you're doing something that you weren't supposed to get caught doing when you were playing Doom. It was no apologies. There was no sort of content censorship. It was like the first time you really saw a game, I was like, wow. I mean, I, I think it was a seminal event. It, it felt adult. It, it really sort of made people wake up and people who are bankers, people who are lawyers, were suddenly playing a video game. And, like, and, and that was such a massive shift and it's really sort of changed the way that the game industry saw itself and they saw this whole new market. It wasn't just colorful stuff for young kids. There was a key moment that I can remember during the development where the game was being worked on, someone was playing it, and I noticed that the janitor that comes in and picks up the trash had just been sitting there staring at the screen for a very long time watching it. And that was one of the points where we really knew that we had crossed the threshold where people that didn't classify themselves as gamers could look at this and be drawn into the world. The thing about Doom is that Doom hit at the right time. Uh, the internet was still, uh, in, in a lot of ways, in its infancy. People weren't sure exactly how to distribute games and software and this, that, the other. And id really built a following for this. They said, we're going to release this game. It's going to be amazing. They put up servers for it. They said, everybody, get ready because Doom's coming. I think they popularized this concept of they knew that their games were the best out there, so they were gonna give you a little sample and then you would give them money and then get the rest. And they had an install base of millions on these sample levels. There was apparently a study Microsoft had done at one point that said there were more copies of Doom installed than Windows in the early days. And this was when we had our shareware versions that people could pretty much freely distribute. And while we sold 
you know, maybe two million copies or something of the, the early commercial Doom versions on there. There were many tens of millions of copies of the shareware version that had been out there and played. I don't think that there was any doubt that, uh, that Doom was going to be a huge success uh, for the company, but I don't think that, that anybody really grasped the magnitude that it would have on the industry. I remember seeing a post on Carmack's blog or on a news website that said they sat down at a table and said, well, what are we doing next? You know, someone threw out, how about Doom 3? And the group kind of nervously laughed or whatever, and then that's when they looked at each other and said, okay, you know, it's time. Doom 3, as far as the decision to do, was a somewhat controversial in, in, inside the company. Me personally, I was a little bit worried about tackling Doom 3 because it's such a big responsibility. There's so many people that are just major fans of it. Working on the new Doom title was definitely stressful because the whole world had an idea of what they wanted Doom to be, the new Doom game. When we embarked on the project, we really knew that we were going to be changing what people were going to expect to see and experience in a video game. And there was an interesting interrelationship between technology and what we were doing from the visual side. It was the beginning of a new era of technology for video games. This was a new era of the technology behind the graphics, where just you sat up and went, wow, that's amazing. I mean, the fact that Doom 3 was released and most PCs, even like our top of the line PCs, could not play it at the level it could be played. It was made for something further down the line. You know, I'm, I'm, I want to be five years from now and just crank that thing up for like, you know, 1200 by 1200 resolution and just go, yeah. With the same number of sort of data that had to be crunched through the computer, we were able to render much more lifelike, uh, much more realistic, uh, almost ultra or, or hyper-realistic environments and characters in the world. And so when people saw uh, the game for the very first time, uh, when they sat down and experienced it in, in a theater at E3 in 2002, we had to remind them that what they were showing was actually being run in real time and was not sort of an in-game cinematic or a movie that had been drawn up beforehand and was just being played over again. Within the first 20 minutes, I was screaming like a little girl when things started to pop out of the shadows. It's this great spook house. It's this is, you know, fun house ride where it's like, oh God, I don't know if I want to go into that room. We could go beyond players' imagination with things that, you know, literally would jump out at them through walls from the floor that they couldn't even conceive of, maybe even in their worst nightmares. A lot of people got exactly what they wanted from Doom 3, which was the Doom experience all over again. But this time, it's the Doom experience times 1,000. It had these, these creatures that were now, you know, drooling. You know, that when they snarled, it wasn't just one frame animation, mouth open, mouth closed. They would get in your face, their mouths would gape wide open, you would hear them, the lights would go out, something would shatter, and now the room is filled with spiders. It took these kind of crude designs from the time and really fleshed them out into far more terrifying creatures. But you knew what they were, and it was exciting to, to see them that way. Bravo team, entry secure. Move in and take positions. Doom 3 was like a huge, a huge gaming event. People were lining up in the stores. People were very excited for it. The graphics were everything they were said to be and more. It was slower paced. There weren't hordes of enemies like piling upon you. It was just kind of a different take on the same game. The early Doom games had a lot of memorable moments where you were just mowing down crowds of creatures. While in Doom 3, it's much more up close and personal, where a specific monster will terrify you. It's 
sometimes seeing that one particular monster that comes out scares you to death that you run away from and hope you're not getting run down from behind. Every publisher and every game developer wants their doom. That's, that's the effect that this game and this franchise has had on the market, in my opinion. It's the one game that no company can ever have ever again because it hit at the right time, it had the graphics, it had the sound, it had the technology, and it had the fans. People devote sometimes hundreds or even thousands of hours of their lives in playing these games, and so the game has a place in their life that's even more than it sort of than it holds with the people who develop the game. We don't do testing, uh, you know, focus testing and group testing and things like that. We're gamers, uh, we love to play games. Uh, we know what we like when we see it, and we basically work on a game until it's something that we think is cool. I look around at how big it's all become, and it all comes from just a few of us sitting in our office trying to make a neat game. And over the years, the neat games have become much neater, and things have gotten bigger and better. But it's been this process of we just sit down and we, we work on our tasks, and things that we have to do today, things that we're working on for the next project and we build the games, we care about how they come out, we want them to be good, and they have been good and they've been successful. And here we have you know, millions of people that have really enjoyed the products, and that's, it's heartwarming. Kid, son, you are now in the Rapid Response Tactical Squad. The double RTS. Kick some ass. The breeze, kill it. Kill them all. I God sort them out. Very proficient already. When we turned up in Prague, we had a two-week um, rehearsal period with the military advisor. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom McAdams. He's a real officer. He's one of the best. <laughs> Trainers, SAS. <laughs> so many of these military advisors probably spent more time in Hollywood than the military at this point. Okay, listen in. Unload! And with Tom, he had just come out, I think, a few months. He had just left after 25 plus years in the services. So there was no kind of jadedness to him. He had just experienced it. So everything was as fresh as it could be. I was leaving the military uh, 13th of September, and this job was coming up at the beginning of October. So I said, yeah, fine, I'll do it for three weeks. And Obviously, I've been here now for three months. It was completely different to what I expected. It's funny, I mean, I've done a couple of military-type movies before, and but I've never had training like this. All right, are we happy with that? Don't put the barrel into the ground, Yogi. Pass that on. Have your wits about you, because rank ammunition does in the Are you safe, Captain? We got time for one more, is that it? What I was brought to do here was to advise on all the military tactics, all the techniques, get the guys to look like special forces and make them look like they've had years of experience soldiering. Magazine 25 yeah. rounds, low. Tom was very determined to, I think for himself as much as anything, make us look as authentic as possible. There is no bullshitting with Tom. Tom is a straight guy, what you see is what you get and I love that. Wait until I give the command up. Okay, rounds down, down on one knee, and then start working together. That's communication. Lead scout, as soon as you're ready, start patrolling. I took it very seriously, because that's what I'm here to do. Okay, okay, mate. Okay, let's do it then. Not only did he kind of instill the, the military knowledge and know-how and skills, but he also helped us bond and form into a, a solid, cohesive unit. The biggest thing was to, to get them to gel as a team. And we started off by going to the gymnasium every morning. 6 a.m., working out together, training together, going through and trying to simulate what soldiers would go through. The only difference is, is, is you know, they, of course, go to war, and, and we go back to our hotel. <laughs> and I call up the pizza place. It was important that they trusted me and got to, to, to listen to what I have to say. Happy? Yeah. OK, let's see a good drill, then. Most importantly was the safety aspect of using weapons. Right, what we're going to do uh, before we actually start is a demonstration of um, what damage a blank, blank round could do, just so that we know on the safety side of it 
uh, you're not pointing weapons at each other. Because they are real weapons. Um, even though we're using blank ammunition, it can still kill you. And one of the first things I do with the guys is demonstrate how serious a blank round is. And the way I did that was to use a polystyrene head and shoot it with a blank round, you know, and it disintegrates. You can make a hell of a mess, as you can see by that. So do not point the weapon at anyone. Always aim off. Time scale, I think, is an important factor in anything, and some of the guys have probably not had the time to practice with the weapons that they should have. So I start from the very beginning and just go through all the basics. When you're holding the weapon, ensure that you hold it correctly, and I'll just quickly go through that. Strip and assembly. As said before, keep the uh, work part you're going to be firing double taps. It's two rounds, OK, followed by another two rounds, so on and so on, until I tell you to stop. Um, I want to look at you and see what reaction it has, OK? Target to your front in your own time. Go on. very interesting having that amount of power in the sense that it's coming from your body, coming from your hands, you know, uh, it generates a certain kind of energy. OK, is anybody not finished? Once I started doing the weapon training and I got to a reasonable standard, I could then move on to patrolling skills, which entails holding the weapon correctly and how you move around objects, how you adopt different fire positions. Then they stoppage drills, loading, unloading, all, all the, the stuff that a soldier, a basic soldier, would have to know. In the script, it was written that, that, that we would say retreat, and Tom was right there saying, no, you would never say retreat, you would say fall back. And I said, OK, and I said, would we say, get the fuck out of here? And he was like, yeah, you would say that too. I was like, OK. We started off with um, Checkmate AK-47s, which are very light in comparison to what we have now. They're just very light weapons. So we had a lot of um, movement drills with that, uh, which obviously at first is kind of nerve-wracking, you know, with the ammo and stuff. Some of the actors were very intimidated by the weapon and nervous of the weapon. Try and be a little bit more relaxed, some of you. I'm not, no, not pointing the finger. Get yourself comfortable. Bring it up, double tap. If you want to get down on one knee, double tap. Stand up or lie down and just get used to different fire positions and just double tap. But try and keep both your eyes open, OK? I'm still flinching. <laughs> it's, you know what, the flinching... No, I'm not too bad with the flinching, it's blinking. Sometimes, and this is the truth, sometimes air comes out of the barrel of the, the weapon and it kind of makes you blink a little bit. It's not fair. It's just, you know, it's air. <laughs> to try and stop the actors from flinching, especially using something like the chain gun or the minigun, call it what you want, it's a 30 cal weapon. And with that weapon system, even though it's firing blank rounds, the actual overpressure that comes out is quite immense and there's a hell of a flash with the thing. Firing this huge gun and, and this huge sound, the flinch would be right in my eyes. And Tom would see that and he would say, Deovi, you're flinching. Do it again. You're flinching. I think I, more than most, had to go through <laughs> a lot of firing to get that flinch out of my eyes. <laughs> what do you think of that, then? <laughs> <laughs> this was the very first time that this, the destroyer has actually picked up that weapon. Now, you see the weapon of choice. So, my question to you is, how'd it feel? It felt... Let's tell everybody at it home. It felt awesome. It's huge. It's, it's massive. No, I'm yeah. talking about the gun. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I went into so much detail was so that they look like they know what they're doing. And everything they do looks like they're special forces.
I'm not going to lie to you, I love it. I have had so much fun. Action! When you are firing a shitload of rounds and it's so visceral, it's so real, you know, it, it really helps me do my job because the leap of imagination for me being in this circumstance, immediately it's not acting anymore. I actually feel like I'm really doing it. It's kind of, you know, our collective hope. When you look at this unit of soldiers, you, actually, you, know, you will see them performing as a highly professional uh, squad of guys. Clear left. Clear right. If you're going to portray our military, then we damn sure better have our shit together and we better look tight with what we're doing. So we should get together and we should know in a certain environment where there's present danger or possibly danger looming, then we should know how to walk, how to talk, how to give hand signs, eye signs, what we're listening for. Look alive, man. Game time. I gotta say, when we're inside that chopper, when that door is closed and all the guys are standing there ready to go out with their weapons loaded, cock lock and ready to kick ass, you gotta ask yourself, the real deal soldiers who go through that, who are standing behind that door, what they must be thinking. They got a lot of love, a lot of respect for those guys. They're the real deal. It's movie shit. It's cool shit, but they're the real deal. They picked it up very quickly, and, and obviously as time's gone by, they've done so much of it, they're, they're starting to switch on to the fact of how to go about it. I certainly wouldn't leave them alone, though, <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you, but, but they are learning. Again, you're, not sure. you're good on the mess. <laughs> Do you want to do it again? Yeah. No, that's good.